If you know how to talk to a man, he will give you unending access to his secrets, his fears, his mistakes. In Proverbs 7, Proverbs 31, we know that the way to a man's heart is through your words. Words decide who you trust. Words decide what you talk and what you speak. Words are doors or walls. Words birth, they kill. Every relationship has been destroyed through words. Every relationship has been birthed through words. Conversation is the master key to life. God runs the entire universe with his mouth. We have stressed this and I want to repeat this. Conversation is the golden key to the treasury called life. Every miracle comes out of a conversation with God, yourself, or another. Conversation is a force. It decides what lives, what dies. Conversation gives birth to faith. Faith cometh by hearing. It also leaves by hearing. When the 10 spies spoke their doubts, faith died, they cried all night. Proverbs 4, verse 7. Very familiar scripture. We'll begin with verse 5, chapter 4 in Proverbs. Get wisdom, which means you're not born with it, which means it's not genetic. It doesn't come through the bloodline. You can be a brilliant father like David and have an idiot son who rebels like Absalom. You can have an idiot father like King Saul and be a Jonathan who understands the knitting of relationship. Get wisdom, which means it's something you've got to pursue. What is wisdom? Three definitions. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Difference in people, difference in a moment, difference in an environment, difference in a countenance, difference in right and wrong, difference in evil and righteousness. Evil is the ability, or, or wisdom is the ability to anticipate a consequence to anticipate a consequence. If you tell a child to jump off the top of a garage, that child will, because it cannot anticipate a consequence. That's why people sin. They cannot anticipate a consequence, wisdom. Wisdom is thinking ahead. Your wisdom is measured by how far ahead you think. One hour, two hours, one day, one year, 10 years. Wisdom is the ability To have a divine reaction to a human problem, a divine reaction, a God reaction to a human problem on the earth, how God would react to it. Why is wisdom so important? It determines your health, your wealth, the flow of favor. Wisdom decides your joy. Wisdom is the principal thing on the earth. It's the most important thing on the earth. There's at least seven ways to get wisdom. Deuteronomy 34 says that when Moses laid his hands on Joshua, that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom, entered him. So the Holy Spirit's called the spirit of wisdom in Ephesians 1.17. He's called the spirit of knowledge in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. Jesus has made unto us the wisdom of God. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 5, Deuteronomy 6 stresses this is that his word is our wisdom. His word is our wisdom. Get wisdom. And all you're getting, get understanding, Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. So preservation is the product of wisdom. We know that God doesn't decide how long we live. There's very few that he has announced their departure date, like Hezekiah or Elijah 
because we know that the Bible says wisdom will prolong our days. There's two distinct things that decide the length of your life. One is your wisdom and one is honor. Commandment five of the 10, if I honor my mother and father, it'll go well with me. My days will be long on the earth. And we know that the purpose of wisdom is to increase the length of our life and to increase the quality of our life, meaning the joy of our life. Life is not something to endure. Life is something that you sculpture through your philosophy or your belief system. So I want to share these seven life philosophies and how they relate to you dealing with life. Some people say, well, life is just hard. Well, it's not the same for everybody. There's people who's learned how to solve problems. There's people who haven't. And you could live a lifetime and never know how to solve specific problems. Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all thy getting. Get understanding. Exalt her and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. A philosophy is a belief system. A philosophy is based on experiences, persuasions, repetitious teaching from childhood. The Catholic Church has said, give us a child for the first six years and they'll always be a Catholic the rest of their life. Because they have taught through their belief system that ceremony creates divine acceptance. No matter how you live, the ceremony will create divine acceptance, whether it's forgiveness or praying for someone that's supposedly in purgatory, which does not exist, but in that belief system it does. But there's philosophies, and the philosophy that you're born into has a great impact on your life. Those first few years are formative. They say a child is what they are by the age of three years old, that their personality has pretty well been stabilized because of their experiences, painful or happy. Our philosophy determines what we consider important, what we consider unimportant. We know that in Japan, there's a philosophy about honor and there's real distinct honor given to the aged, the elderly. Every belief system is different and every belief system has a part of the truth. That's why it's sustained. Belief systems that you and I do not even agree with. The woman in India who throws her baby to a crocodile and the gods are appeased and they're, they're okay. Or the one in, who prays to a little wooden statue that they carved out of a tree and this is their God or representative of their God. All those philosophies have created a feeling. You always return to a place of pleasure. You always return to a place of pleasure. So anything that you believe that creates pleasure, peace, change, you embrace that, right or wrong. And sometimes we base an entire belief system on something that happened one time. If we said a certain word and about that time, the lightning struck that time. Boy, don't say that word. I know what happens when you say that word. So sometimes we create a whole belief system based on an experience. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. I have studied almost every belief system there is because I could see well-meaning people that had a reason they believed that. And I went through a season in my life for two years when I had a fear of believing a lie still have a fear of believing a lie. But I thought, what if I was born as a Hindu? I would be a Hindu. If I'd born in Buddhism, I'd be a Buddhist. But I was born in a Christian pastor's home, so maybe that's why I'm a Christian. How do I know that others are not right? How do I know that I'm the only one that's right? Because it was very important and still is important to me uh, to be correct, to be accurate, to really be accurate I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to look real. I want to be real. I don't want to look right. I want to be right. 
and it's important to me. And this is why I can't wear, I can't wear fake diamonds. I had a guy tell me something, look, look at that, look at it, and nobody will know it's not real. I said, I do. I know it's not real, so I can't. Uh, there is nothing more tormenting and chaotic to the human spirit than to believe one way and be appearing another way. That's very chaotic. It's, it's very destructive. So I can't sit there and act like everybody sees see, see my ring. Oh, that is gorgeous. Oh, what, woo, I'd hate to see what that sets you back. And there's something, if you got a little realness into you, there's something that wants to tell you, I got it for $20. It's not real. Let me understand that. Somebody brag on your dress. Oh, I got this on sale for $15. You, there's something in us because it's, it's more peaceful. We're going to always pursue the path of peace somehow inside of us. We're all going to look for the path of peace, whatever creates it. There's seven life philosophies. The first has to do with God. My philosophy toward God is that everything created has to have a manufacturer. Everything that, that is created, and it's number one, put it on the screen. There's three parts, belief, logical, and relationship. It's logical to believe in a God. It's just logical. It makes sense. Why? A book has to have an author. A song has to have a composer. A product needs a manufacturer. There had to be something before there was anything created. So it's very normal to believe that there is a divine birthing agent somewhere in this universe. He has to be greater than us, greater than the product. A man who believes that everything came from nothing has to have a lot more faith than a guy who believes there's a God. I've often wondered, who do, who do atheists think when good things happen? Well, that must be a, a horrible place to be. Can I borrow a little handkerchief there? The uh, tissue things. I went through a two-year period. What if there was no God? What if I did all this holy living down here and died and got to heaven and found out there was no heaven? Shoot, I missed it both places. I could have had more fun here and missed it there too. The proof of God is simple, change, change in nature. There are men who have been drug addicts and simply call the name of Jesus and instantly drug addiction was broken. Alcoholism has been broken. The proof of God is to have a change of nature. Something natural suddenly becomes harsh to our spirit. Proof of God is peace, whispering the name of Jesus. His word creating an appetite for righteousness. So it's logical and it's important that you develop your belief in God. You may not understand him. And the God of Muslim or the Muslim God of Allah and in Islam is not the God we think of. They have a completely different picture because their God is a very different God than the God of the Word of God. The God of the Bible is a very different God than the God of Islam. Are all belief systems the same? Of course not. There are systems of deception. I was thinking this morning when I was listening to love music I've never heard love music to Muhammad. Muhammad, we love you. Oh, we love you, Buddha. Brother Buddha, you're so precious to me. Because love is not the force. And Jesus brought distinction between the belief systems when he says, by this love shall men know you follow me. <laughs> love is the distinctive difference between Islam and Christianity. Very, very different. Everybody's talking about the mosque being in New York. Every victor places a memorial 
where they conquered an enemy. That's not unnatural to want to build a mosque where 3,000 of your enemies died. And it's crazy, but you got to realize this belief in God. When you say God, it's not the God of others that others think about. If I say Father, I think of a man of God on his knees with his hands uplifted. You may think of a father that came in the middle of the night and through alcoholism slapped you and spit on you and cursed you. So when I say Daddy, you have a different picture than when I say Daddy. So when we say God, I think of a righteous, holy, loving God who protects us, who talks to us, who converses with us, who wants us to be gentle toward others and nurture caring toward others. So your philosophy about God and there's and 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 is can be very different than others. So you've got to when you tell people that you believe in God, what kind of God? A personal God, a God of expectation. And I do not believe, I do not believe what many people believe about unconditional love. Most people believe when they say God loves me, they mean God loves me without any expectations. Duh. <laughs> There's nothing with greater expectations than, than love. When you fall in love with somebody, do you have expectations? Oh, you go ahead and you go over with several more today. Just make sure you come home at night. Oh, no. Love has expectations. And divine love has expectations. So never confuse unconditional love. Now, it doesn't mean that God quits loving us, but his love has expectations of change. And he does that. And the purpose of his expectations is not to gratify and make him feel worthy as some big God. He doesn't have us to worship him so he feels good at the end of the day. Wow, tell me again how great I am. Tell me, tell me, tell me, I just need that. His command to worship is to insert in our equation the ability for joy, the ability for focus. And so when he gives us an instruction, our obedience doesn't pleasure him because he feels more powerful or greater, but the obedience allows him to be God to us, to show his nature to us, to show his love to us. Jesus couldn't even do many miracles because of unbelief in a city. Now think about that. There was so much doubt in one city that God could not be God. Jesus could not be Jesus. And obedience allows his greatness to become our experience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every moment of obedience becomes a trigger for a seasonal change, an increase in our joy. Obedience corrects the equation. Obedience makes satanic influence impossible. Obedience weakens an adversary against you. Obedience takes you out of the zone of defeat and puts you in the zone where you cannot fail. My second philosophy is my philosophy toward people. People are the crown of creation. If you watched Glenn Beck last night, it was a fascinating picture. And I think that Glenn Beck must be a frustrated preacher. <laughs> I think somewhere he got off the track in the Christianity thing, but there's somewhere the God part of him is waking up strong. And he don't quite know what to do with it. But they were showing last night the difference between the belief system and of course, Christianity was the first that introduced the educational systems. Even Yale and Harvard and all. The church was the birthing of the educational system of the earth. And now they saw that and of course they've we, we realize all the demonic things that take place, but they showed last night how that Christianity is so different than the belief systems. But we in Christianity believe that the crown of creation was man. 
that he made us just a little lower than the angels. You say, well, I, I, I believe we came from monkeys. Well, I don't doubt that many people have. I do not doubt that. I, I would never argue about that. Oh, not for one moment would I think that everybody came from God. But the ones that God created are the crown of creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. Humans are the one with the conscience. Humans are the one with the ability to see right and wrong. No, I do not believe that I evolved. I believe I was in the mind of God. And they try to say this happened six million years ago and they can't even say what happened yesterday. But they're gonna tell me what happened six million years ago. It's like a prophet went to tell me my future and I said, why don't you just tell me something that happened already? People are the crown of God's creation. They're his ultimate product. And there's many levels. There's circles. Jesus had seven levels of relationship. Not every person will have the same value to you. Some are your protégés. Some are mentors. Some are golden connections. There's your blood family that God has given you for linkage. And it's so powerful and so strong. It's what stabilizes the earth. I cannot emphasize this enough to you. There must be continuously restoration of love toward people. You can easily build your future around a painful experience. You'll hear women say, yeah, that's men for you. There's women, been with five or six men out of three billion on the earth, that's men. What scientist would draw a conclusion from two animals? But you'll hear a man say, that's, that's just woman. That's a woman for you. Every person has a different function and a different purpose. I feel that people is where we demonstrate the nature of God. And we find their purpose and look at their difference and magnify their difference and what is their divine role in our life. Let's talk a little bit about people. They're the crown of creation and diversity. Diversity is a God thing. It's a necessary thing. It creates change. It creates new. It creates impartation. Even the flowers are different. Now, I don't understand racism at any level. At, at any level. I, I, I just flat don't understand it. It, has, it makes no sense. If I wasn't even a believer, it would make sense. And it's very important that we not only embrace diversity but see it as a divine gift to us. A divine gift to us. We cannot know everything, we cannot see everything, we have different cultures, different levels of understanding, and it's for impartation. It's not to contest, it's for impartation. Remember where John 1, 12 said, to as many as received to them he gave. Receiving is a master life skill. Can you receive somebody's difference? Can you receive the difference in a child? Many years ago, I was dating a pastor's daughter and she was half my age. And uh, her father, I was out visiting them. He pastored up in Iowa. And we were all out eating and she was doing something. I said, uh, what do you think about our age difference? He says, if you'll let her be her age, you will have a marvelous life together. But if you try to make her your age, both of you will be miserable. See, if a person has 10 experiences a day, in a year you've got 3,600 experiences. If there's 10 years difference, you've got 36,000 experiences. Somebody's ahead of the other one. Somebody's 36,000 experiences ahead which means that nothing you do is understood by the person 36,000 experiences before you. How many understand that? It's important to embrace difference. Whether it's the child, their children. 
their children. Daddy, when my brother John was born at the age of two and three, they brought Daddy, they brought John Jr., my father's uh, namesake son, oldest son, my older brother, and brought him to a doctor and he said, something's wrong. And they began to describe what my brother was doing and said something, we feel like there's either demon spirits. And the doctor, when they started saying what, what he did, the doctor started laughing and said, that's a boy. That's what boys do. They, they tear into a drum to see if there's anything inside. That's, that's a boy. Sometimes we don't want to embrace that, but you have to have a philosophy that difference is a God thing. It's a divine thing. They say that men are headliners and women are detail, the small print. That you ask a, a woman something, she wants to tell you how she got there and all the details to it. That women, I don't know how they judge how many times, you know, women talk so many words, et cetera, and I don't have any idea. But the fact is that there's difference. Two or three facts about my philosophy toward people. Not everybody belongs close to you. Not everybody belongs close to you. First, nobody needs all of you. I said, nobody needs all of you. All these men of God you see on TV and you sit there, wow, whoo. That's the part you like. Their family sees another part. Not everybody needs all of you. Not everybody wants all of you. Not everybody could endure all of you. There are parts of you that God will have to give somebody a special. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3. Every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, He gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. 
Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. There are parts of you that God will have to give somebody a special grace to shrink that deadly part of you. My mother used to say about my daddy, because my daddy, all the women come and my daddy say, oh, your dad's so good looking. Oh, oh, he's so good looking. And daddy always had a lady that would want her. Hi, Sister Murdoch. Oh, Brother Murdoch, you look so good. Very responsive to daddy and trivialized my mother. And my mother would go, Psh. that's my mother's reaction. Psh. They couldn't live with him a day. She'd say they couldn't live with him a day. And everybody says, your dad's such a sweet old man. I said, yeah, he got that way when he got old. None of us kids would have left the house had he been like he is now. We'd have never left the house. Embrace difference. Magnify the part that God stored in people for you. There's people who are quiet. There's people who are very verbal. There's people who, who hide their feelings because they don't feel safe in exposing their feelings. Maybe they've been wounded when, when they shared some of their pain or a weakness. I also believe that everybody is sick somewhere. I don't believe anybody is fully whole. You had met me. I met you. That's why I'm saying I don't think anybody is fully whole. I think that everybody is damaged somewhere. And I believe if you think that you're whole and you think that you've got all the pieces together and you think that everything you may have more damage than everybody else. The point is not to hide the brokenness in you, but to bring it to the Father. Bring it to the Father. And I urge you today to bring your pain back to the factory like the product that goes back to the factory who knows how you operate, who knows what your needs are. And you do not, one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit, the invisible Jesus who accompanies us on my right side, one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit is that I never, he never requires an explanation of my conduct. I don't have to explain my brokenness. On this trip, I went through a couple of days of immense pain and uh, I've got some eardrum problems and having to go trying to hold off of surgery for a few days so I can get all these meetings cleared up. And uh, both eardrums are completely shot. They're gone. And he said, there's no cure. It's, there's nothing for them. It has to, I'll start all over and try to create an eardrum. And so between my ears and my left side of my face, for about half the trip, it was just incredibly painful. Now, I've lived long enough to know nobody cares <laughs> How many understand that your, your headache is not, your cancer is not as important to somebody else as, as their headache? They don't care if you've got three days to live. We'll enjoy these three days. We'll be praying for you, you know. So I've lived long enough to realize you're something you just, you, just, you just walk through. You just walk through. Nobody wants to hear you. And nobody wants to complain. I know this. So I, I was trying. So I was in my hotel room, and I'm walking back and forth, praying the Spirit, and I'm sitting here. And then I just, oh, I was dying inside. I just, just, uh, and I didn't know it was my teeth. It wasn't my ear. I mean, it was just, and I never have headaches and all that. Then suddenly I had them. And I loved knowing I didn't have to tell the Holy Spirit where I was hurting. I didn't have to explain to him how distracting it was from my mind. I didn't have to explain anything. You want to get so aware of that that you begin to carry God's presence into every personal relationship into every personal relationship I was thinking of a Brenda this morning Brenda Holsinger, Pastor Dean's wife and so much is on her mind this morning we was over there praying about a, something that's very important to her be important to me and I was sitting there thinking how, how her mind 
must be going through such a battle, through so many things, and to bring the presence of God into that relationship. If I'm talking to Josh, bring God's presence in me into our connection. When you're on the phone with somebody, let's pray right now. Let's ask God to do something. But carry God's presence into your people relationship. Do not separate God from a personal relationship. Bring the God in you into their zone. They may be so distracted. They may have lost focus. It may be that they've even lost the ability to worship. It may be that they're so troubled about the problems in their life, they can't even picture God anymore. So we bring and we thrust. I have a song where thrust me like a seed into wounded soil. Hallelujah. So where there's been death, my life, the life of God in me, the life of God in me begins to bring life back into that person. We carry his presence. I said we carry his presence. We carry his presence. You must get skilled at discerning people. You must become very skilled at discerning. Discern their weakness, their strengths, their difference, and their difference is more important than their weakness. Discern their life function. Discern their needs. Listen for the sound of pain. Listen. It only takes one missing conversation to create chaos. They say if you take the letter U out of the alphabet, you lose 3,000 words from your vocabulary. The $200,000 car doesn't go anywhere without all wheels. I just move one tire and it doesn't go anywhere. So sometimes in our life, there's just a single missing conversation. Everything's right, but there's one thing missing. So you look and in every conversation, listen for the missing element. Listen for what's present and always bring all of you into a conversation. Don't ever allow your mind to drift if somebody's talking to you. I had so many thoughts today. When the beautiful children came over to me to show me pictures they had and love notes to me, and that meant a lot to me, and I had so many thoughts where their life will go. And my mind wasn't on anything else but them, their difference. And what kind of reaction were they desiring from me? There are seven reactions. I don't have time. I'll have to complete this here. But there are seven reactions that we reveal the nature of others. What is their reaction? In the presence of greatness. Do they show honor, etc.? What's their reaction to greatness? Authority. What is their reaction to correction? What is their reaction to a mistake? I had to work with a little girl here in the church for a good while, just when she was three and four years old, because when she made a mistake, she was tormented if she made a mistake. And uh, when she made a mistake, it just, it just it drove her crazy. She couldn't bear it. And I had to keep saying, baby, it's all right. That's the way we learn. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, don't take that so serious. And she would ride a, her bicycle, but she didn't know how to stop. When she stopped, she jumped off and threw the bicycle to the side. She, she didn't. And so I screamed out, I hollered out one day. I said, baby, what's, what? she said, I don't know how to stop. Boy, I had a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> I said, baby, when you want to stop, just start pedaling backwards. And of course, instantly, when she started pedaling backwards, as she stopped and she could get off, she learned. Some of us, we, we can't hardly, when we make a mistake, we're so devastated. We, we spend all of our energy on that, at that mistake. Learn from it, but refocus. Refocus. Extract what you can, but refocus. I think it's important. Reaction to God's presence. 
There is no hope. I stress to young people dating, if a man or a woman does not love God's presence, now is the best they'll ever be. Today is the best they'll ever be. It's the presence of God that creates change. It's the presence of God that creates hope. So what is their reaction to the presence of God? Three is learning. Learning. Everybody say learning. That's why we know that predestination does not mean predestination of decisions. But God has only predestined the outcomes of decisions. God said, if I obey him, the blessing will come. If I rebel, the curse is on me. God has not predestined human decisions. God has not already decided who is saved and who is lost. If he did, there would be no reason for wisdom, no purpose, no advantage in a teacher. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do well. So success is not a divine decision. Mike, I believe my destiny has already been preordained really well then don't learn anything don't teach anything go home wait for it to happen destiny is the result of decisions destiny is the result of your decision making it's very comforting to believe that no matter what happens everything works out all right you ever heard people say that well in the end everything works out all right oh really really so there's no reward for obedience so there's no pain that comes from rebellion? Look at somebody next to you and say, ignorance really makes me sick. Just look at them. Just say, ignorance really makes me sick. Look at someone right close to you and just say, ignorance really makes me sick. It is natural to learn. God created us as learners. I consider myself a professional learner. That's what I do for a living. I had a lady say, what do you do for a living on a plane one day? And I said, I'm, I'm a learner. She went, uh, I mean, what do you do for a living? I said, I, I'm a learner. That's what I do. That's what I do for a living. I'm a learner. I'm a professional learner. There'll be very few days in your life that you don't do something stupid. Very few days. Just see yourself, I'm a learner. I learn about people. I learn about life. I learn how about communication. I learn negotiation. I learn conversation. I learn. I'm a learner. Say, I'm a learner. I mentioned earlier there are several ways to get wisdom. The easiest way to get wisdom is to buy it. So I do. I've spent as much as $10,000 in one day at Jacksonville, Florida for books in one day. I think it's 10900 10200 something like that. I never spend under $500. If I go to a bookstore, that's my time. I invest because I can access another man's conclusions in an hour. I don't feel like I have to read every book through. I read a book. When you go to the store, do you have to eat it all before you leave? No. So when I read a book, I look for the part that motivates me. I look for the part that moves me from where I'm at. I don't have to read every book from beginning to end. I'm looking, a book is like, it's like a pantry. I access the part I'm wanting for that day. I may read one page, I may read 30, but I'm never obligated to read a book all the way through. You go to a restaurant, do you go back there in the kitchen and say, where's the rest of it, all of it? No, you access the part that you are needing and you eat the part that you're needing. Same way with a book, collect books. Go to the secondhand bookstore where you can buy books 10 cents each. They're by people who no longer saw the need of that book or they had two copies or people gave it to them. It has nothing to do with value. You can find a book for a quarter worth more than a book brand new that cost you $50. Say, well, uh, uh, you get what you pay for. You never get what you pay for. There will never be a day in your life that you get what you pay for. I've gotten little with big prices. I've gotten a lot with small prices. The price has no indication of its value. You ever been to a real fancy restaurant? 
the kind that has no, they only do two digits like 38. They don't have period 00, 42, 48, 54. He said, boy, this, this food must be good. Right? I must eat one meal. This thing carries me two weeks. It's so expensive. But when you get through, eight, when they bring it to you, have you said that, Brother Harold? Little steak, what, two and a half ounces? Weight Watcher Special for the children of pygmies. I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at this little tiny, tiny piece of steak, $32. Good Good night. And I'm a negotiator. I don't, I don't like to be taken. The easiest way is to buy knowledge, buy information through books, and through time. Remember that your time is currency. Never think that green paper with dead men's pictures is money. Money is anything that has value. My attention is worth something. My time is worth My presence you are a walking collection of wealth and you trade a part of you for the universal currency we call money. Invest time, invest time in a mentor. These three days, and I feel like these three days are important. I feel like it'll be the last three days that I do publicly in public ministry for protégés. I will do the rest through videotapes and CD DVDs. So these three days, the last three days of this month is very important to me. They're very big to me. I've stressed that. And I know that those three days where I teach hour after hour after hour, I have enough sense to know that in three days a person will gather more than they could gather in 10 years of books, 10 years of reading. So invest time in mentorship. Mentorship is learning through another. Mentorship is learning through the pain of another. Mentorship is learning from the losses another has experienced. Mentorship is wisdom without the time of waiting. Remember that time is not in any success equation. Time is not in a wealth equation. Remember that your future is coming to you at the rate of your decisions, the speed of your decisions. Your future is not according to a calendar. Your, cute, your future comes to you relative to the questions you ask. Questions decide decisions, and decisions decide the speed that your future races toward you. Some of you, because you don't ask questions and because you don't study, your future is your future's sleeping. It knows you won't arrive for another 20 years. Smile. You're crawling toward your future. But if you want your future to race towards you, it will with the questions you ask. There are rewards in learning. Change, the loss of pain, the increase of pleasure. Number four is your philosophy toward problems. I consider problems to be the reward system created by God. Problems are invitations to relationship. Until somebody has a problem, you are unnecessary in their life. Whether it's emotional, comfort, money, it's problems that create relationship. If there were no problems, there wouldn't even be marriage. Nobody would get married if they didn't have a problem. Problems are invitations to significance. Problems are seeds for rewards. When someone has a problem, you have an invitation to reveal your difference from others. David had no future until Goliath arrived as a problem. You sitting there at your house need to grab a hold to that. When there's a problem in your environment, that is an invitation for your difference to be magnified to others. Your reaction to a problem is a prediction of your financial future. If I have a problem, I needed something done the other day. I'm trying to get a, a laptop fixed for a, one of our, our uh, people of our staff. And everybody said in the IT department, we're going out for the weekend. We got this. We got to go. And I called Brother Daryl. Didn't I, Brother Daryl? He's afraid I'm going to ask him to do it again here. He's... And I said, Daryl, I know you're off tomorrow. I know that. I know that. I know you got plans. Could you change your plans for me? Because there is something I've got to get done. He said, I'm happy to, Dr. Murdoch. 
tell me what you need. He didn't say, well, if you let me know two days ago, see, I got, I got, you got to understand, you know, I, I, I got things to do too. You know, we all got, we all got things. Can't he wait? He didn't try to talk me into waiting till Monday, waiting till Tuesday. Boy, a reaction to my problem tells me everything. Some of you have dropped relationships in a moment when you realize your problem didn't matter to them. Problems are invitations to prove love, to prove caring. Continuously ask others, is there a problem? I have a minister friend I talked to this morning, and he always asked me, do you need anything? What can I do for you? Is there something I can say? What are you? Use questions to look for problems. What can I solve? Five, attitude. Attitude is a choice. Three words, focus, energy, and choice. Let's use the word energy. People with energy have more value in some environments than those without energy. Attitude matters. Many years ago, I had a young lady that worked for me, and everything was just, everything was, she was excited about everything. A nail, carpet. She was just excited, everything excited. Name was Tammy. Precious girl, good-looking girl. Sweet. Ran my music ministry. She was always up. Dr. Murdoch, just energized. Pulled open the file cabinets one day, and everything was so chaotic. The Imperials, a famous quartet at the time, was wanting to do a whole album of my music. They had been writing her every week, please get all these songs together. She had never, it was just a mess. And I said, oh, honey, this is horrible. This is a IRS agent's dream. I said, uh, I, can't, I can't keep you on staff. So she cried and I felt bad, but I sent her to Bible school. Brother Kenneth Hagin's, you know, rain by Bible college old Tulsa paid her way through. But two weeks after she was gone, came back in the office and everything's like death. I mean death, people sitting there. I had never realized that my staff was so boring until Tammy left the environment. When she left, it's like everything changed. Everything changed. Nobody, there are people that when they walk in, the whole place lights up. Just a difference in, attitude is something else. Attitude. There's, and she, she's just smiling. She's one of the kind that could smile over nothing without a reason. And the, at first it throws you like, well, why, why are you laughing? What's the joke? I didn't hear the joke. Tell, why, why are you laughing? Life is good. She's one of the kind, you know, hell, oh, oh, no heat bill. You know, she's just constantly, she's one of those kind that say about the devil, at least he's, he's persistent. She found something good about everything. Everybody, everything. She was always up. Everything was created for a relationship. Everything was created for connection. There are people whose attitude unlocks something in you. Sometimes you may be you may be the kind that's just so responsive to everything that you need somebody real calm, just sitting there, and they they their presence enters your equation, and the best in you comes out in their presence. I'm not worth much by myself. Oh, I can't, there's so much I can't do. There's so much I can't do. My best dies in me unless the equation. I'll never forget Dr. Cirillo looked at me one day, Mark Cirillo, and he, said, he made this statement. He said, my anointing will not work if I don't have competent people around me. My anointing shuts down. Isn't that amazing? What is your attitude for? Focus decides your attitude. Focus is a mood. And your attitude will require music. Music is a necessity for correction of attitude. Your, your attitude will change in, five, in two minutes. 
you put on the right music, something happens to you. So don't forget to sculpture the environment that brings the best out of you. Whether it's the sounds of an ocean. I'll get into that sometime. I plan to come back here to the Wisdom Center and I'll finish this message sometime. Number six was change. Change is a sensation of new and you were created for new. God's a creator, you have the nature of a creator in you. I love new, that's why I love shopping. I tell everybody, uh, you know, that I saw that book says, real men hate shopping. That's when I found out I was part woman. I love shopping, I love to shop. I think uh, heaven without a mall will be hell. I think change is important. Changing in seasons, the feeling of new, there's a reward to change. It's new courage, new energy. And I have a philosophy that knowledge creates continuous change. Knowledge creates continuous change. And the changes in your life are proportionate to your knowledge. Pain will not create change. Knowledge will create change. And number seven, tithing. It's a huge, it's a huge thing to God. And that's why it's a huge thing to us. The word tithe means 10% of your income is holy. It doesn't belong to you. We're not giving it to God. We're returning the tithe to God. God said, when I bless you, I'm going to give you an extra 10%. Everything that you make, everything, he gave us everything we have. My eyesight came from God. My hearing came from God. Everything, I, my ability to walk, talk came from God. I don't have anything God did not give me. And when I return the tithe back to him, the tithe is proof I trust him for a future. The tithe is proof of gratitude that I'm thankful. And thankfulness is the seed for more. Thankfulness is the seed for more. There is nothing more magnetic than a thankful person. Tithe is a picture of human gratitude. Thank you. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom, be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. 
the wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.